don't go off. And there we go. We are now live. Welcome back, um, everyone. We are uh, here with another live networking event on the 17th floor. As a reminder to all of you, the 17th floor is an online community focused on the growing practice of human capital management, which gathers human resource, accounting, and payroll professionals together for the first time in a social community for peer-to-peer -peer engagement, education, and mentorship. Every couple of weeks, we host one of these live networking chats featuring industry guests um, in which our members uh, can chat uh, can chat with them um, as well as just listen to this live if you know, you're not here live with us and you're watching this later. Um, can chat about our experiences in uplifting businesses by elevating the well-being of our employees. My name is Sam Fiorella. I am a member of the 17th Floor Community Management Team, and I'll be acting as your moderator today. Uh, most of us uh, getting onto the topic of today's chat, uh, we're very unfamiliar with the concept of remote work uh, in 2022, 20, uh, especially, if not remote work, this concept of hybrid, the way that we are today. Many businesses saw it as something of the future, not the present, uh, but now with the pandemic being in post-pandemic uh, situation, we've all had to deal with this and many are still struggling. It's now here to stay, whether we like it or not. Uh, and how do we educate, engage, and support our employees to ensure that they're happy working in these hybrid and work environments and that our organizations are getting the most of our workforces? So that's today's session. Uh, and I've asked two people to join. Uh, we have one of our board of advisors here on the 17th floor, Bianca Mueller, uh, who is WagePoint's community manager and an award-winning certified professional bookkeeper. Uh, one of the many designations we have here within the 17th floor. She has 14 years experience um, as a respected thought leader and social influencer in the Canadian bookkeeping industry. Two phrases or two concepts that I never thought I'd be putting together in a sentence. So we, we're going to have, Bianca, you and I are going to have to explore that on a future chat. Um, but she's an early adopter of cloud technologies, which I think makes this very uh, applicable and why I, we really wanted her as part of this community or a discussion. Um, and then we have Dr. Vince, Dr. Vince Molinaro, who is an entrepreneur, a leadership advisor, a speaker, New York Times bestselling author. Uh, Dr. Molinaro is a leadership advisor, speaker, and author of a New York Times bestseller, The Leadership Contract, which is now, by the way, in its third edition. And I'm exhausted just from that bio, so I don't know about the rest of you guys. So welcome, Bianca. Welcome, Vince. Hey, Sam. Good to be here. Hi, Bianca. Thanks for hosting this today. And yeah, it's a pleasure. Awesome. So why don't I kick things off? Uh, uh, Vince and I had a conversation the other day uh, that basically changed the way that I thought that I was going to be managing this chat. It started uh, initially, it was let's talk about how do we support employees in uh, managing hybrid work environments because um, it has been a challenge. I know it has been for our organization. Um, and, you know, we're seeing the conversations in this, on the 17th floor as well as uh, across all media outlets and, and industry publications. But Vince said something to me that I, I thought really opened my eyes. And it's because before you can talk about supporting the employees, you have to make sure that your organization is set up um, and that your team is flexible. So I'd like to take a step back um, and ask two questions that I'd like you guys to talk about or, or share your thoughts on. And the first is, what are we measuring? So if we say that we want our company to go into a hybrid work environment and that we want to achieve a certain level of productivity, a certain level of success, how do we know where we were before the pandemic, which seems like a thousand years ago? You know, so Vince, are you noticing in your consulting practice, um, you know, and in the lectures that you do that there's a discrepancy uh, between where we were and where we think we need to be now. Yeah, I, th you know, it, it's it's a it's a great question to start. And, and Bianca, I'd love to get your perspective as well. But as I've been listening to all the conversations that I've been having with customers and senior leaders, as well as reading, you know, uh, just a plethora of content around. Uh, this topic of remote and hybrid work and the future of work, because I think they're all interconnected. You know, for me, the question that keeps running through my mind is that that there's a um, and the way I've described it is is that we're having kind of a pre-pandemic amnesia, 
uh, is that we we kind of think that before you know our world was upended, that everything was was great, and and if we're honest with ourselves, there isn't a lot in the research to suggest that was the case. So pre-pandemic studies show that only 35% of employees were actively um, engaged. So that's a big chunk of employees moderately engaged or completely disengaged, but they kept showing up to work and we kept paying them. Um, number two, uh, studies show that pre-pandemic, 61% of Americans felt disconnected and lonely in their jobs. And these are the same people that were coming into your offices. Um, and so we had this romanticized, this romantic uh, notion of the office environment and what it was like, uh, you know, people thinking, oh, yeah, I was connecting with colleagues all the time. We were having these chats. Yeah, not really, uh, if we're really honest. So I think that's the starting point. Let's get honest of where we were before, uh, because I think there's a little bit of thinking as we move forward that we need to go back to what we had. And I don't think that's the way forward. We have to reinvent how we're going to work together to be effective. So I'll pause there and Bianca, jump in. I'd love to get your perspective if that resonates at all with your experience. Definitely. I think that the um, the personality of the employee is completely variable in that situation and that some people can't authentically show up um, in person, in real life. They feel better and more comfortable in an in a environment that they have a safe space. And public environments aren't always a safe place for employees. So I, I agree that it really needs to be redefined. It's not a matter of going back and saying, what was the benchmark and where do we want it to be now? This is a whole new situation. Yeah. And as we saw, you know, Sam, to your point around the productivity issue, we saw, you know, uh, people maintain or even um, supersede some productivity uh, you know, gains uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, certainly the, 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 um, the, the time management benefits of the flexibility that comes with remote work are huge. However, that's counterbalanced with age and stage. If you had young kids, if you had this, if you had that, it was not, it was not easy. And I think some of those things we're going to have to continue to figure out to support employees uh, to, to be effective. And then we see the the data that suggests that a lot, you know, certainly with the conversations I have with my customers as they've surveyed employees, it, it's very, it's, a, it's very consistent, you know, a vast majority like the flexibility, want some kind of remote and hybrid, but at the end of the day, the bottom line is they want flexibility. And, and that is what we have to start with and respond to, uh, I think. So what I'm hearing, uh, Vince, is that we're not necessarily comparing apples and apples uh, when it comes to setting those benchmarks that we're trying to achieve, right? So trying yeah. to com trying to set up an environment now where we're achieving the same type of environment or the same type of efficiencies or the same type of workplace, comparing it to where we were is ineffectual and actually probably setting us up for failure. Well, I, you know, I think part of what we have, I think part of where we're going to have to figure this out, and, and I have to come clean, my experience, just, you know, as a worker, uh, is different, because I've, I've worked a lot in remote situations, I've led virtual teams, I've led, you know, national and global teams. And so there was always a heavy virtual aspect of that of that work and so you have to learn a lot of skills of how do you bring people together some of whom have never met before to you know deliver on a project and drive high performance and do it with a sense of fun um, and a sense of collegiality uh, so so for me that those experiences um, is a little different because I, I think if if you've never had that experience and all of a sudden you're trying to absorb all of those differences, I could imagine that the challenge is not insignificant uh, for people. And I think a lot of companies are, are, are there because I think, uh, I mean, a stat I read, you know, uh, during the pandemic, like only 5% of employees worked remotely. Uh, uh, so, so that's a big chunk of people that have been all thrown into this massive experiment uh, to see how, how they, how they did. So I think, I think it is, you know, there's a lot we've got to, kind of figure out and and a lot of it is on managers and leaders to do it so they're setting the right tone for their teams i agree i'm going to add a point there as um the concept of having um a flexible work environment is sometimes the driving factor to wanting to be able to work remotely or in a hybrid in, in environment but the reality is 
there's a lot of skills and a lot of, um, you know, personal accountability that needs to be at play. And people don't know if they're capable of that until they literally start doing it. So the idea of it could be one thing and the execution yeah. could be a whole other reality. Yeah. Well, and you, and you raised, you know, the, the, a word that's near and dear to, to my work around accountability, because certainly as the pandemic unfolded, you know, as I was reaching out to, you know, the senior leaders in my network, you know, the question I got was, well, how, how does this change your thinking about the work you do around leadership accountability? And, and I said, well, you're implementing it in your organization. How does it change? How, how have it, has it changed your perspective? And every answer was, oh my God, accountability is going to be even more critical now, right? Because you're not looking over someone's shoulder. Um, it's it's pure results. And so you're going to have to trust people that they're going to deliver what they promise to deliver and do that at a high level. And and I think there's also a trust element to all of this that's that's going to be that's going to be important. Um, and I also have and, and you know the perspective might be a little black and white, but if you're worrying about team members that A, you don't trust them, B, they're not accountable, the question is, why are they on your team? <laughs> uh, because that you're exactly right, Bianca, that, that personal accountability is going to be more critical now. Shifting yeah. gears. Oh, sorry, Bianca, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, shifting gears slightly on that note, Vince, do we need to rethink like for now, we're, let's talk about management a little bit, uh, because clearly management needs to be looking at this differently. We need to be really thinking, are we comparing the right things? Are we setting up the right milestones? Do we even know what our benchmarks were? Because I assume a lot of companies didn't have these types of benchmarks in the past. So is um, as managers, do we need to be rethinking, do we have the right employees for this new world of work and consider potentially let you retraining people, letting people go, bringing on different people? Is that part of setting us up for success in the future today in this transition? Well, I would, I would say the first question is personal. <clears throat> uh, do I, as a manager or leader, have the capabilities, you know, to, to lead in a, in a hybrid world? So let's start there. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, because I think I think it, it, you know to your point, Bianca, it it does cause all of us to develop new skills and new capabilities. Some of which we may have had and not exercised nearly as much as they need to now. Some are, are new capabilities we have to acquire. But I think I think it's incumbent on every manager and leader to first do a little bit of self reflection on that before they start looking kind of at their teams. It might also be. Um, depending on the situation, it might even be too early to, to make some very definitive uh, decisions on that because I, I'm not sure in a lot of cases whether it's been completely figured out what, what the future is. And we're seeing it is a struggle, right? We're seeing, uh, you know, in the press, <clears throat> CEOs who, you know, a lot of the, I, I don't think any, any of them are concerned with providing flexibility. I think they understand that. But I think the concern is really around culture. And there's a sense of, can we build a vibrant culture? What do we lose if people are working remotely a good part of the time and disconnected from each other? I think that's a valid, a valid question. And I think it's just, you know, I don't think the answer is 100% in the office 100% of the time. I think the 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 answer we still have to figure out on 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 that. And I think that's where we're going to get a little bit more refined in our work and our thinking around, okay, when does it make sense to have a virtual meeting and when must we absolutely be together? You know, I think that's some of the work we'll, we'll figure out. I, I don't know if anyone's got that completely thought through just yet. What's been your experience, Bianca? Um, you know, I, I work completely remotely. The company I work for, WagePoint, has never had a, an office since its inception and in, since yeah. 2012. And even before that, I was always remote ready. And that was like 14 years ago. I was remote ready at all times because I had a young family and I needed flexibility. And that's what got me into the cloud technology and adaptability um, mindset. Um, but you know what? Honestly, I think that having a cohesive work environment, whether you're working remotely or in office is is the key because you can't expect your employees to have a different mindset when they show up in person than when they're working at home. You really need to have consistency and cohesiveness between both those work environments and the tools they're using and the softwares they're using. So 
so that so for my team listening um you know the 17th floor community management uh, clearly this is an hr uh, obviously a new big hr challenge in getting people um, remote ready as bianca said i love that term that's probably going to be the title of that an upcoming uh <laughs> discussion which we're going to bring you back for uh so yeah so let's add that to the queue and let's have that deeper dive into how we do that uh but what's required uh going back to management again before i don't want before we talk about employees let's go back to the managers and the organization will set up it's something that um i think hr and payroll professionals are all going to have to deal with um in terms of how they lead managers across the entire organization right because this is not just an hr payroll department issue this is any management position that has to deal with whether it's clients or employees, internal employees, sales staff, customer service staff, whomever, uh, in these hybrid work environments. What are the tool sets or what's the mindset, Vince, that's going to be required by managers to be adaptable? And is, do they, what training do they need or what are some tips that we can give them to get them thinking in the right direction? Well, I, th I think, you know, the... the, the the operative word you use was mindset, right? I think that's the starting point. Like what, what is, how do we need our managers to be thinking? And, and it's, and it's going to need to be uh, kind of, you know, that, that, that growth mindset, that, that adaptability, that, 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 you know, bringing that kind of agility where it's sort of like, well, let's try something new for a period of time to see if it works. We don't know if it's going to work and, and let's see how, how this plays out. I mean, even my own team, we've, we've kind of kept evolving. We have a weekly team call every Monday morning and, and we kept evolving it to, to make sure we were, you know, creating a meeting that not only brought clarity uh, for everybody on what, what we needed to do, uh, but also how did we drive team commitment and that sense of team spirit as well. So, so I think, I think an openness to experimenting and, and to kind of try, try things out. Uh, the, the other thing, you know, practically um, speaking, that is part of the mindset is that the mindset now needs to be more relationship oriented. I, I think I think the it, we need to be more deliberate at being in touch with people, um, even even virtually, because, uh, you know, I think in the office, we didn't have to worry too much about it because you knew that. Um, your team was going to be there. So if you wanted to get out of your office or your workstation and walk around, you knew you were able to meet them. Now you've got to schedule something or, or, you know, or call them up. And I've seen lots of, you know, really simple and innovative things that, you know, one senior executive of a global company, he, he's a, uh, you know, always a morning person, was always in the office at, at seven because that was his, his uh, prime time to do some deep work. And then he realized as things became more virtual that, and he had a global team. So he had to be av available for different time zones that that 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. And then he had like a 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. time frame where he was just available for his team. They didn't have to book anything, it, you know, and he could do his work, but then people could just drop in to, to chat to see, you know, how he was doing and whatnot. So little things like that. There's a ton of these innovations. I, I don't know if it's an innovation, but practices that I've seen people put into place uh, and teams put into place that really means they're figuring out how to move forward. They're not thinking about, let's go back to what was, they're figuring out the future. Yeah, there's a bit of a like gray area that's sort of segueing now where, Okay, we've 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 got our company culture to adapt to this more of a digital culture and a hybrid acceptance, and then it becomes this. Well, why can't I do this all the time? <laughs> and it's like having that definition as a manager and defining why you need this for the company in the best interest of the employees and the business, without you know navigating that area of like we're not doing this to control you because that's like the first instinct that a lot of employees yeah. are having in these environments yeah and and i think you know given your experience bianca and and it, it's good that um all the community members of the 70th floor maybe maybe your inbox will get will get loaded up but to your point there are a lot of people that have have already who are very familiar with this world and and there's a lot that they've learned that I think they can share uh, with folks. So, you know, a, a personal example, uh, a number of years ago, I, I got a global role. So now it was in a global role, had a global team. And now you're 
you know, having to accommodate different different time zones. And it wouldn't be uncommon for there to be days where you start at 7 a.m. and go straight through 7 p.m. And, and you just back to back to back calls with your team or customers or whatever. Well, what did I do in the early days? Well, I did what I always did. I drove into the office, <laughs> uh, got, got myself into a meeting room. Uh, and then 12 hours later, I'd come up. And the, the first day I realized, well, that was stupid. <laughs> Why would I? Why would I come all the way into the office to be closed in a room, not meet any colleagues? Uh, and so, what I quickly realized is, when I have those days, I'll just work from home. Uh, I'm more efficient. I save on the commute. Uh, and then the days that are a bit lighter and have some open pockets, that's when I'll go into the office. So I can grab coffees. I can have informal chats. I can, you know, you know, take take colleagues and team members out to lunch. And and so that was sort of my own learning. And I think we're all going to need to do that. But you know, I think there's so much that people already know that we can be kind of sharing with each other, you know, and that, and that's, you know, the, uh, you know, like, you know, the 74 as a community really in my mind is, is really going to be the model of how organizations are going to operate as communities. And, you know, to your point, as you introduced it, what is it? It's about, you know, peer to peer relationships, learning from each other, um, you know, education. That's the same thing we're going to need a lot of in organizations um, in many ways. To segue off that and, and to answer Kathy Hill's question in the chat here is how do you make new employees feel feel comfortable and welcome? You know, like you say, go to your community, find an ambassador in your company that is really embracing the hybrid role and has a lot of enthusiasm and, um, you know, just adapted really, really well. And, and, and leverage them, empower them to, to spread the word and, you know, help other employees feel welcome and accepted and, you um, and that, you know, there's there's people out there to help. So, yeah. Yeah. And so what's been your experience then? Like, you know, as, as you're thinking about it as someone who's been doing this since 2012, mm -hmm. and if you were to, you know, say to uh, a manager or leader uh, watching this, what have you learned are the top two or three things to pay attention to in terms of, you know, in, in answering Sam's, uh, you know, I spoke a little bit about the mindset. What else would you add to that? Well, I think there's a two-step approach, depending on if you are speaking to a grandfathered employee that was their pre-digital uh, world, <laughs> pre-hybrid world, or if they've been hired knowing that that was going to be the expectation. And yeah. I think that's where a lot of people are navigating right now, especially in this, you know, em employee world. It's like the seller's market, right? It's the employer's, it's the employee's market now. And um so when people, when employees are getting hired, they they know that that's going to be the understanding and the expectation yeah. now. So they're already prepared and they have the intention that that's going to be expected of them. But yeah. when you have grandfathered employees that are having to adapt and still trying to, um, you know, you know, evolve in this new world, it's a different approach. And that's where, like I said, those ambassadors within the company or these other employees that find it really easy, utilize them, connect them and use them as a mentor opportunity. And um, it really, really, really will spread. And then, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I think as, as, as you're chatting, you know, what, what then becomes important as new people are joining, and this was you know, we, we had to pay attention to this before all of this too, right, is is really hiring for culture fit, right? You know, mm -hmm. a, a lot of times, you know, you know, you've done a great hire when you're talking to someone and, and, and they're and you're talking to their peers and they go, it's like they've always been here. That's sort of like, okay, check, we, we, we got it right this time, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's some of the work we've got to do. Um, you know, we've got to do th this way. I think the other thing is, I, I had, um, a senior leader in my network reach out during the pandemic. He he landed a new role, head of marketing, uh, for a company, and everything was done uh, remotely. So he had never met the CEO, members on the executive team, and uh, he was always very good at, at developing a pretty thorough ninety day plan uh, to to guide his in, uh, his integration. So he reached out to me saying, "I knew how to do this before. How do I do this when, you know, I don't know who." you know, I don't, I haven't met most of the colleagues or my team members in person. Uh, and I said, just dial up the number of people that you want to talk to. So he had a list of, he wanted to meet about 10 people. I think he tripled that. It was 30 people. Um, so that was, that's not an insignificant amount of time for a busy executive starting a new role, but he, he kind of, 
you know, my idea kind of resonated with him, got kind of at his gut. And, um, and then he sent me an email, uh, you know, a couple months later, saying it was like, so amazing how effectively it worked, even virtually the connection he was able to establish with his team members. Um, and at an executive meeting, the CEO uh, had commented that, the feedback he had been getting was exactly what I just shared that this individual, it felt like to a lot of people, he had been with the company for years, even though it was, you know, about four months. Um, and, and so again, a lot of things are possible. Uh, and, and, and that's some, but, but it just takes a different mindset, a different level of commitment. And in some cases, a different set of uh, um, activities than, things I think we could have just taken for granted in the past. Now we need to be a little bit more deliberate on, on doing those sorts of things. I'm glad that Kathy asked that question. Um, that's a great conversation to have. And for anybody else that's out there listening live, please feel free to post your questions in the uh, comment bar and uh, we'll have our panel uh, discuss it. But th this is interesting. I want to stay focused on management and, and, and our responsibility here. Who is the right team or the right job title, the right uh, organization within your company to actually lead this change? Because it sounds like there's going to be a, there's a, a potentially a corporate policy change shift here. There's going to be training issues involved. There's going to be monitoring and benchmarking. Um, you know, employee reviews are going to be completely, uh, you know, put on their ear. Uh, I know within our organization, just as an example, over the pandemic, we hired almost every one of our employees without ever meeting them face to face. We hired about nine employees, I think, without ever meeting them face to face until they, you know, until the first opportunity to come back into the office. And one wow. woman in particular, a very, very, very capable um, woman who was, we were really excited to bring on board. And our very first video chat, very first meeting, she wouldn't put her camera on. And we said, well, you know, where's your where's your video and she goes oh i don't do i don't do videos i you know i i just i don't come on camera as well you're we're remote you know what i mean how do we get to build like a, a relationship with you so i mean and i know that my business partner and i were just completely aghast like well what do we do not because we cared that she didn't want to be on video but how do we handle this situation and we were completely lost as owners of a company and managers on how to deal with something like this so Clearly, there's got to be some leadership on that front. Uh, who within the organization is best in this new corporate environment to sort of be the champions of this change within the organization? Bianca, it looks like you've got a perspective. Yeah, I'm you start? My head. <laughs> so, you know, in, in this new world that we're navigating, we also have to be extremely mindful of inclusivity. And in order to create an inclusive environment, those pieces have to be optional. Like there's there's really no, it's not black and white in our world. You know, at the company I work for now, WagePoint, video is always optional. It is never, ever, ever a requirement. And everyone needs to know that because people feel put on the spot as soon as the camera's on their face. And maybe they're not extroverted. Maybe they're not like me and they don't have an opinion on everything, <laughs> you know? So I think that it's really important to ensure at the time of hire or even better in your job description to spell those expectations out before you get to that point where it's like, oh, OK. Yeah, I, IBM had um, I, I, I mean, I got it right, but we can get the source and can share it with all the members had a, like a work from home pledge that they created just to give managers that kind of, you know, kind of rules of the road um, and, and also set expectations for, for employees. So I think that, that, you know, um, inclusivity is, is critical, right? So to me, that just points to the flexibility and adaptability that managers need to have, right? Because uh, one could challenge, you know, Sam, well, if, if that, that new hire, if she's producing the desired results and feels like a, she's plugged in as a member, does it matter whether the camera's on or camera's off, right? Uh, and I think your point, Bianca, about you know the you as an extrovert, that was a comment I made early in, in the pandemic as, as remote work was becoming uh, a reality. I said, you know, the extroverts are gonna lose their mind and the introverts are gonna be in their happy place. And, and I think that that's, you know, that, that's gonna be something. In terms of like who, who's gonna own, own this and that's the 
key question and it's a great question and and you know it's just my perspective but it's really this is one of these moments for uh hr leaders to really kind of you know just just take this on behalf of their organization right because they've got a lens on kind of the employee needs employee expectations they're obviously do work to support managers connected in with the senior team um and then and then have a good sense of the research so in many ways i think they're they're in the best position and and often you know that they, they not they own it outright but but certainly they pay attention to culture issues uh, more than anyone so I, I i think it's time for hr leaders to just say this is our time <laughs> and uh and let's let's lead let's lead our organizations uh, through this uh, through this period. I got to challenge you there, maybe. Um, I, what I, well, that's not actually a challenge, but one of the things that I've been it's seeing okay to challenge in the in the seventeenth floor. Yeah, I'm not afraid to do that, but that's, that's not really a challenge, just because there is such a shift in the organizations right now, and not just on this digital <laughs> hybrid env- uh, environment. But what I'm seeing in the seventeenth floor is that there's a lot of payroll professionals and payroll departments. Uh, where they're not necessarily embedded within the HR department. But right. it's those payroll professionals that are leading this charge because, you know, um, the, the, the concept of a payroll professional is, is well beyond just being clerk and, yeah. and processing benefits and, and checks and more leading the organization in terms of what's the, what, how do we make our employees stronger yeah. uh, practically not yeah. just administering policies, but leading it strategically. So that's another option for people who are listening in terms of who might do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just to be clear, yeah. I, I was using HR in its broadest sense that included that, but you know, I think, I think it'll, it'll vary company by company, but you know, we're not going to need one person to lead us through this. Uh, we're going to need a number, a number of people and, and whether, you know, you're in a recruitment or whether it's, it's a compensation or wherever, uh, if this is, pa- is a passion for you, help your company be successful at this yeah. moment in time. Right. And, and that is a whole idea of human capital management, which is what you know we're all about here is how do we grow our companies by empowering and improving the lives of our employees outside of the work environment, not just inside of it. Yeah. Uh, this has been absolutely fascinating for me um, on a number of fronts. Uh, this whole idea, Bianca, that you said that we have to be mindful of inclusivity when we're thinking about whether we mandate people come on camera or not. Linking that to the concept of inclusivity is something that I had never considered. Um, and I'd like to think that, you know, as an organization, we're pretty cognizant of, you know, uh, you know, being mindful of these sorts of things. But I never put those two together because it's never anything that I've been trained on because it's not something we've had to worry about in the past. Yeah, if it's a if it's a requirement of the job, like obviously for me, I'm a community manager, I present, I educate, I do webinars all the time. So it was a job requirement for me and it should be posted in the job, you know, when people apply. So maybe that's where the transparency needs to take place. So the intention is set. Yeah. Oh, uh, like I'm I'm just okay. So like I've got like a gazillion questions and in, in terms of I need some help, and I'm sure people out there are gonna be looking for this as well. But I think I'm going to call this uh, this session um, here. So I want to talk about, uh, so I'm going to tease a future uh, session that I, I'd love the two of you and anybody else that's listening out there who wants to participate on. I want to start, to, I want to have a whole entire session, not about management and benchmarking, but now how do we actually uh, educate our employees? How do we encourage those you know, introverts that maybe don't want to talk as much? Because I know I had that challenge just, you know, to set up the next uh, session. Uh, so I'll give a personal example. During the um, uh, uh, during the pandemic, when we were all working remotely, we were trying to replicate those in-person uh, networking, those in-person social things that we would do like on a Thursday afternoon or on a, you know, like a, a certain lunch that we would all go out to or something like that. Or when somebody brought in a birthday cake and we all got together and we got to socialize and team build we were trying to force those issues through digital and some people embraced it people like myself that that is an extrovert and others just hated it didn't want to say anything because they felt that they had to do it but you know they just you could tell the look by the look on their face their lack of participation and then it team building became a detriment just the idea that they were trying to we were trying to force them to do something digital because we had no choice at the time 
um, meant that it was having a negative impact instead of a positive impact. So there's just so much that has to be broken down and that we're not going to have the time today. So I think that's how we're going to set up our next session, uh, which is how do we actually now get the employees uh, adapted to and comfortable with these types of technologies? And how do we then divide when you're at work physically, you know, how does your schedule differ and how do we train people to work differently when they're in the office to maximize that environment? And then what should they be doing when they're at home? And what's the difference? So I think there's a lot that we can unpack there. Agreed? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Sign me up. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Dr. Molinaro, why don't you give us um, uh, a little bit uh, about yourself as we say goodbye? Uh, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, what kind of questions can they be asking you either in our community or directly? <laughs> Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Bianca and Sam. A great conversation and and uh, lots more to explore for sure. Um, yeah. So we, um, you know, my my company, Leadership Contract Inc. We we help uh, primarily working with leader populations, working with companies that are at key inflection points, to help the leaders understand how they need to lead the future more effectively and do so uh, more effectively together. And and so uh, if people want to reach out, LinkedIn is probably the best place to do it because once they do, then all of our ideas and our content that, that that's shared is there. And our website is, it's really simple, drvincemolinero.com, where you can learn more about uh, what we do and, and the work um, and the kind of impact uh, that, that we have. And um, yeah, so that that's that's it. And if anyone has a questions, I will be popping into the Seventh Leaf Work community from time to time uh, to reach out and and respond, or they can reach out directly as well. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, it, on the seventeenth floor, as you saw noted, uh, there is an entire section in our forms that talks about uh, remote work environments and hybrid work environments. Uh, so please feel free to engage each other, share ideas. <sighs> Uh, Bianca is one of our board of advisors, so she obviously has a profile there. You can, I encourage you to follow her on the 17th floor, ask any questions directly in that channel. Um, uh, she's all, one of our, our great mentors that I think a lot of you will really get some invaluable uh, support from, as you saw here. So thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, I'm, I'm your go-to. I'm a community, I'm a person, people connector. Um, you know, my my passion is the digital world and accounting and bookkeeping and and just fintech and how it's evolving and especially the future of payroll. So, yeah, throw all the questions my way. If I don't have an answer, I am super resourceful and I enjoy research. So I'll find you an answer. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, careful what you wish for, because you're going to have yep. like a whole list of questions coming out of that. Well, everybody, thank you uh, again uh, for those of you watching us live. I appreciate you taking a half an hour, 40 minutes here out of your day for those listening to us either on the podcast or, um, you know, uh, as a replay on the 17th floor. Please feel free to uh, ask any questions in the comments uh, or hop on over to the forum. Either way, uh, we'll try and get back to you and we'll connect you to the right people. Uh, until next time, we're back in two weeks with another session. Check out the uh, networking session on uh, or list on the uh, 17thfloor.com for uh, upcoming uh, sessions. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.